Well, good morning, Walden Church. Today is the first Sunday of November, and that is uh, Communion Sunday for us. We are setting aside the first Sunday of every month to break bread, to pass the cup, and to share in the Lord's Supper. And so we invite you uh, to Walden Community Church uh, to experience that fellowship, to experience that communion in person each week. Uh, today we're going to look at Ecclesiastes chapter 3, and this is from King Solomon. He says, For everything there is a season, and a time for every matter under heaven, a time to be born, and a time to die, a time to plant, and a time to pluck up what is planted, a time to kill, and a time to heal, a time to break down, and a time to build up, a time to weep, and a time to laugh, a time to mourn, and a time to dance. A time to cast away stones, and a time to gather stones. A time to embrace, and a time to refrain from embracing. A time to seek, and a time to lose. A time to keep, and a time to cast away. A time to tear, and a time to sow. A time to keep silence, and a time to speak. A time to love, and a time to hate. A time for war, and a time for peace. I think for many of us in our lives, there always comes a time when we are called to empty out a closet or a room or even an entire house from people who have passed away. Maybe it was a friend, could have been a spouse, maybe it was your parents. And you find yourself sifting through old clothes and empty luggage and familiar furniture and drawers and drawers of kitchen items, old camping equipment and hundreds of books. And you find yourself asking, what do we keep? What is of value? What can we donate? And what do we throw away? And it's in that moment that you are reminded of this passage. Because on the one hand, you feel loss, you feel sadness because you miss someone. And on the other hand, you feel guilty for going through their things and possibly getting rid of some stuff, but you also realize that they are no longer around and they will never use these things again. To everything, King Solomon says, there is a season, a time to gather, a time to scatter, a time to collect, a time to donate, a time to accumulate, a time to let go a time to keep, and a time to throw away. Last week we talked about saying yes to godly wisdom. And certainly Solomon's words here, I think, are wise too. Wisdom is knowing when is the right time for all of these activities, to know which things are worth preserving, which things are worth holding on to, and which things are not. At the end of the musical, Fiddler on the Roof. Tevye's family is packing up a wagon and they're going to leave their village. The Russian forces had driven the Jews from their homes and now they're fleeing as refugees. And after the agonizing struggle of sorting through all the family treasures, Tevye had just experienced this dramatic moment. So the writers give the audience a little levity and Tevye makes a joke with his eldest daughter and he says, don't forget the baby. The audience laughs. But it is a poignant line. Tevye knows that life sometimes forces you to let go of things. But when we experience loss, we still have to hold on to the things that are important. You can throw out the bathwater, but you can't throw out the baby. Today is Communion Sunday. It's also the first month of November, and this is when we typically think about maybe the pilgrims and Thanksgiving. And in the middle of this series of us saying yes to God, I'd like to remind us all that sometimes we have to also say yes to change, to say yes to new. Because people typically don't like change. We resist new things more than we welcome them. But even the Thanksgiving story, right? 
It's a story about new, new land, new traditions, new experiences, a whole new country. Communion was new because of Jesus, right? Jesus took an old, familiar tradition, passed down from the generations, and he said, from now on, you're going to have a new reason to celebrate, and you're going to have a new tradition. So how can we learn to say yes to new? How do you know when it's time to hang on to something or time to let it go? How do you tell the difference between trash and treasure? How do you know the difference between junk and jewels? My dad recently had a violin repaired. He had to put it in a box, mail it far away to a person that knew how to repair it, somebody he trusted. And originally, the violin had been a small investment. He picked, up, uh, he picked it up from a suggestion from a friend, and he'd had it for a long while. It was an old violin. My dad uh, probably could have looked over it had someone not suggested it. And if you had taken it to a pawn shop, they might have said, oh, you know, I'll give you a few bucks for it. But when the repair person opened it up, she discovered that it was much older than my dad suspected, perhaps as old as 300 years old. And by the time she had finished and sent it back, she estimated that the violin was worth $10,000. I'm sure that you have some treasures like that in your home, but I'm not qualified to tell you how much your household goods are worth, but the good news is we have a guidebook that tells us about our spiritual life, tells us what is worth keeping and what should be thrown away. And of course that's the Bible. <laughs> so I want to look briefly at a couple of passages that'll help us decide what to keep and what to throw away to get ready for the new. When the people of Israel were slaves in Egypt, they were there for 430 years, God sends Moses to lead the people out of captivity into the promised land. And then when we read about the Exodus in chapter 12, God tells the people that there's some things he wants them to get rid of. It says, the Lord said to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, this month shall be for you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year for you. Tell all the congregation of Israel that on the 10th day of this month, every man shall take a lamb according to their father's houses, a lamb for a household. And if the household is too small for a lamb, then he and his nearest neighbor shall take according to the number of persons. According to what each can eat, you shall make your count for the lamb. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male, a year old. You may take it from the sheep or from the goats, and you shall keep it until the 14th day of this month, where the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel will kill their lambs at twilight. Then you shall take some of the blood and put it on the two doorposts of the lintel of the houses in which they eat it. They shall eat the flesh that night, roast it on the fire with the unleavened bread and bitter herbs they shall eat it. Do not eat any of it raw or boiled in water, but roasted, its head with its legs and its inner parts. And you shall let none of it remain until the morning. Anything that remains until the morning you shall burn. In this manner, you shall eat it, with your belt fastened, your sandals on your feet, and your staff in your hand, and you shall eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover, for I will pass through the land of Egypt that night, and I will strike all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast. And on all the gods of Egypt, I shall execute judgment. I am the Lord. The blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over and no plague will befall you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. This day shall be for you a memorial day and you shall keep it as a feast to the Lord throughout your generations as a statute forever. You shall keep it as a feast. Seven days you shall eat unleavened bread and on the first day you shall remove leaven out of all your houses. For if anyone eats what is leavened from the first day until the seventh day, that person shall be cut off from Israel. On the first day you shall hold an assembly, and on the seventh day a holy assembly. No work shall be done on those days, but what everyone needs to eat, 
that alone may be prepared by you. And you shall observe the Feast of Unleavened Bread, for on this day I brought your host out of the land of Egypt. This is Passover, right? This is Passover when the Bible says the Feast of Unleavened Bread, this is the holiday of Passover. Passover is kind of like Thanksgiving. It's the meal that remembers a great journey. It's a large holiday that's centered around food, family, and typically a Jewish family would eat uh, fish and matzo, uh, it, which is a soup, right? Uh, brisket, roast chicken, potato casserole, carrot stew, uh, sometimes even potatoes or sweet potatoes. But did you notice what the people were to eliminate from their houses, throw away from their diet during this tradition? What were they supposed to get rid of? Yeast, right? Leaven. Why? What, what's so important about that? Well, the Lord knew that if they made bread with yeast, then they would have to wait around for the bread to rise. And their enemies would have overtaken them. And they would have been slaughtered or returned to captivity. But what if you don't like unleavened bread? And you said, this is how I've always done it. I'm not willing to change. Well, I guess if you love yeast so much that you can't do without it, then you're not going to the promised land. Yes, God said no to yeast. But it was so that they could all say yes to freedom. They had to say no to the way they had always done it. They had to say no to tradition, perhaps even throw out a tradition. But it was crucial for their survival. Now, of course, yeast is not the point of the story. Whether or not we bake bread with baking powder or baking soda or yeast, that's not the issue. Rather, yeast is the metaphor for sin that can overwhelm us, overtake us, sift through us. The Israelites were instructed to leave the land where they had been slaves. And in leaving, they weren't to waste any time. There was no time to lose. The Egyptians were still mourning their dead, but then they would get anger, angry, and then their anger would replace their sorrow, and they would be fast on the heels of God's people, and they would destroy them, which we see happen in this story later at the Sea of Reeds. Likewise, when we hear God's call on our life, God calls us to leave behind the sin that enslaves us, to go towards freedom, a new life, and there's to be no lingering, no holding out, no holding on, because if we say yes to sin, it can overtake us. We can die. 1 Corinthians 5 says, Your boasting is not good. Do you know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump? Cleanse out the old leaven that you may be a new lump, as you really are unleavened. For Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. Let us therefore celebrate the festival, not with old leaven, the leaven of malice and evil, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. What is Paul saying in this passage? He's saying that by tolerating a little speck of sin in your life, it infects your entire body. It'll infect an entire community. In 1998, the Monica Lewinsky scandal broke out. And during that time, polls showed that American youth began to regard the importance of sexual purity less and less. It was on the decline. I mean, think about that. That the ill behavior of our nation's president, his indiscretion, trickled all the way down into the American home. A little leaven infects the whole lump. Any parent knows that if one child gets a cold, it's not over until every member of the household has caught it by which time the first child has already probably caught a new disease and it starts all over again. Doctors know that when you deal with something infectious, 
those who are ill should be quarantined so that others don't catch the disease. That's why t teachers tell parents, if your child is sick, what? Don't send them to school. Well, sin is like an infectious germ and it corrupts everything that it touches. Just as leaven changes an entire bowl of dough, sin affects every aspect of our life. It affects our relationships. And the Bible says that if you tolerate sin and you allow it into your community, it's the same as if you had never left Egypt. In other words, you are still a slave. First John 2 says, do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. When Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead in John 11, he calls out, Lazarus, come out. And the Bible says the dead man came out of the tomb, his hands and feet wrapped with strips of linen, and there was a cloth around his face. And Jesus told the people around, he said, take off his grave clothes and let him go. Now, do you think Lazarus was in a hurry to leave those grave clothes behind? Or do you think he kind of got used to the smell of rotting flesh and he liked the feel of cool, dank darkness and he said, I'm going to go back inside the tomb and take a nap. That sounds ridiculous, doesn't it? But that's some of us is still clinging to old grave clothes of sin and death, whatever it is. Maybe we prefer our old habits. Maybe we prefer those over telling the truth. Or we're so used to responding to people uh, quickly and angrily instead of being kind. Or we think we just can't make it through the day without a cigarette or a beer or a piece of candy. Or, and we put our trust in those things instead of putting our trust in God and allowing him to help us. You can rely on your bank account for security. We think that we can't make it through life if we don't have those loser friends around us that are always leading us down wrong paths. And we go back to our old haunts and our old hangouts because they're familiar and they're comfortable, even though we know those things are secretly and silently killing us. It's important, the Bible says, that you rid your life of yeast, of sin. It means removing anything from your life that would tempt you to sin. If you are left to your own strength, left to your own will, you can still find evil so alluring that you'll come crawling back to it. The Bible says the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Sin is like a magnet. It has an attractive quality that hypnotizes you and you are under its power. That's why Jesus came. He came to be your Passover lamb. That is why we share this meal today. That is why we are reminded of the cross today, that Jesus came to remove the penalty of sin and he came to destroy sin, destroy its control, destroy its power over us. When we sing the hymn, Oh, for a thousand tongues, we sing, He breaks the power of canceled sin. He sets the prisoners free. His blood can make the foulest clean. His blood availed for me. This is why Jesus was nailed to a cross on Passover. It was his blood that was on the doorposts of our hearts. It was his perfect life that was given. And this is why a few nights before, he sat in an upper room, gathered around a table, sharing the Passover meal with his disciples. The Bible says that day of unleavened bread on which the Passover lamb had to be sacrificed, Jesus sent Peter and John saying, go and prepare the Passover for us that we may eat it. They said to him, where will you have us prepare it? He said to them, behold, when you have entered the city, a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him into the house that he enters and tell the master of the house, the teacher says to you, where's the guest room where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? And he will show you a large upper room furnished. Prepare it there. And they went and found it just as he had told them. 
and they prepared the Passover. And when the hour came, he reclined at table on the apostles with him, and he said to them, I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer, for I tell you, I will not eat it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he said, Take this and divide it among yourselves. For I tell you that from now on, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And likewise the cup, after they had eaten, saying, This cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. But Jesus, we already have a covenant. But Jesus, this meal, this meal already has a meaning. You know, I kind of like the old way better. Jesus said, behold, I make all things new. But just like leaven, sin, if left in our old life, corrupts. So we need to embrace new. Because without new, there is no forgiveness. We need to learn to say yes to change. To say yes to new. When we pass the elements, they seem familiar to us. They seem ancient. But they were new. It was a new way of looking. It was a new way of thinking. It was a new way of worshiping. When the Israelites were told to make unleavened bread, it was new. They hadn't done it that way before. They had to let go of old things. They had to let go of the past. They had to let go of tradition. And they had to embrace new. And we can learn to do that too. We can learn to say yes to new. I would suggest start with obedience. Always start with obedience. We must obey God. This was from last week. Jesus says, hear and obey, right? In other words, do what God says. If you see junk mail pop up in your inbox, just hit the delete button. You don't need to open it. You don't need to read it. You don't need to read it out loud to other people in the room. Throw out the yeast. Don't wait for the bread to rise. Abandon sin as fast as you can with everything you have. Sin is disobedience. Commit to following God no matter what the cost, knowing that the benefits are going to far outweigh anything else that you have to give up. We worship a God of new. We worship a God of change. And so we follow him no matter where he leads. We are obedient the benefit to the children of Israel who gave up yeast, they inherited freedom. They inherited a brand new life. Likewise, the benefit that you get when you give up these temporary pleasures, when you give up sin, it'll be a spiritual liberation here on earth and eternal life in heaven. Second, allow the church to help you. Lazarus couldn't remove the grave clothes. Jesus told everyone around that they had to unloosen him and let him go. Why are we so afraid to ask for help? Why are we so afraid to ask for prayer? Ask the people of God to help you. That's why we are all here. Jesus made the church so that none of you would have to go through this alone. Please don't be so proud that you think that you, you can do this all by yourself. We are in this together. That's why we have a women's ministry. That's why we have a men's small group. That's why we have a small group on Wednesday. I would encourage you plug into any one of those or start your own small group. Start your own small group in your home. We need more touch points. We need more ways to foster community. Find someone you know who loves you and who will hold you accountable for anything that you are struggling with. You're not gonna let them slide. They're not gonna let you slide. And if you blow it, they're going to tell you. Ecclesiastes says two are better than one because they have good reward for their toil. For if they fall, one will lift up his fellow. But woe to him who is alone and he falls and has not another to lift him up. Again, if two lie together, they keep warm. 
But how can one keep warm alone? And though a man might prevail against one who is alone, two will withstand him. A threefold cord is not quickly broken. Let the people of God help you. They, they can help you discern what to throw away, and they can encourage you what to say yes to. They're going to guide you away from the things that hurt you, towards the things that help you. They're going to guide you more towards all the ways that God says yes. The hardest thing about fighting sin is thinking that you have to do it alone. You don't. That's why God gave us each other. And third, be willing to let go. You got to be willing to let go. I know you've thought it before. You've probably had the same question, but how come the scribes and the Pharisees didn't recognize Jesus? Right? They knew the Old Testament. They knew the signs. They knew what to look for. They didn't recognize him because he was new. He brought about change. He did things differently. He didn't do things the way they were raised. He treated women as equals. He taught Gentiles. He welcomed children. He touched the sick. He didn't hate the Romans. And anyone who said, we like the old way. You know, we kind of we like already how we make bread. We like our Passover traditions. Anyone who said that back then or now, they don't get to experience Jesus' new. Okay, but no more change, right? I mean, Jesus made all the change back then. So now we're locked in. The Bible doesn't change. So the church is never going to change. I don't believe that. We have to always be discerning. Discerning means that we show good judgment. It means we pick through life and we know what to keep and we know what to throw away. And it means that we recognize, like King Solomon said, the seasons. The passage we read in Ecclesiastes says, for everything there is a season and a time for every matter under heaven, a time to be born and a time to die, a time to plant and a time to pluck up what is planted. Something can be good for a time. It can fit a season. But like a plant that is now out of season, it can wither and die. And then it's time for something new. You know, back in 1980, not long before President Reagan took office, the Soviet Union had invaded Afghanistan. They were throwing their weight around. They were trying to take advantage of everything they could, trying to expand their king kingdom. Not, not like today, right? Thank goodness they don't do that anymore. And uh, our current president back then was Jimmy Carter. And I think maybe he might have shown a little weakness and the Soviets took advantage of that. But then in 1987, Ronald Reagan had a plan and he conferred with his advisors and he, he wanted to give his now famous Brandenburg speech. And all, his, all of his advisors, including Colin Powell, said, don't, don't, no, 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 don't do that. Don't rock the boat. Don't encourage change. It's, it's only going to make relations with the USSR more difficult. Don't poke the bear. Ronald Reagan didn't listen. And he felt that this season for the Soviets was over. And he felt that it was time for new. And so he stood there and he delivered his famous line. Mr. Mr. Gorbachev, Gorbachev tear, tear down, down this wall. This wall. And when he said it, something happened. The world changed. In 1989, the Berlin Wall came down. And then a few years after that, the Soviet Union disbanded. Now, you and I, we are probably not going to make that kind of impact in the world. But certainly, moments like that do not come along for people who never change, who embrace the status quo, who say, you know what, I like things just the way they are. What can one person do? As Christians, we are not called 
to be the gatekeepers of tradition or to make sure that the church never changes. Rather, as followers of Jesus, we are called to obey God. And then when it's our turn, we do the right thing. Reagan was one person, but he knew that just like any other monster that hides under the bed, it could be exposed if you pull back the curtains. Look at David. He was one person. And the whole army was terrified because there was a giant standing in front of them. And David looked around and said, it's one guy. Just pick up this rock <laughs> and I'll kill the monster with a rock. And now it's our generation. It's our season. It's our turn. You and I, we're going to follow in the footsteps of our Messiah. We're going to follow in the footsteps of our Passover lamb. We're going to follow in the footsteps of our king. And when I read the stories about our king, he flipped tables. He slept outside. He ate outside. He, he ate with sinners. Walking through the grain fields, he allowed his disciples, oh no, to eat grain on the Sabbath. He turned water into wine. But we act like we're disciples of the Pharisees. We act like we're disciples of the scribes. We are not. We have to stop acting like it. We are disciples of the God who says yes. We are disciples of the God of things new. And then we take that bread and we take that cup and we look at it, we should be reminded, this is the new Exodus. This is the new Passover. This is the new tradition. This is the new celebration. This is the new covenant. This is the new promise. Communion is new. It's a new way to worship. Ephesians 4 says to put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful desires, and to be renewed in the spirit of your minds and to put on the new self, created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. 2 Corinthians says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. As Christians, as followers of Jesus, you are, you are all about new. <laughs> You, you are all about new. You are brand new. You are new. So let's try new things. Let's, let's look for new ways. Let's walk new paths. Let's say hello to new people. Let's learn to love new faces. Let's shake new hands. Let's embrace new brothers and new sisters. Let's sing new songs. Let's sit in a new place. We can give new. We can serve new. We can love new. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. Would you pray with me? Lord, we can't help but think about Lazarus standing there wrapped up in grave clothes, literally dead to his old self, literally alive and new. How different his new life must have been Lord, you have called us to leave behind Egypt, to make an exodus, to leave behind leaven, to embrace the new path to the promised land. Lord, it is difficult for us to change. It is so easy 
to do things the way we've always done them. It is so easy to fall back into my old habits and my old patterns. It is so easy to do today the same as I did yesterday. It is so easy to strive for mediocrity. Lord, we believe it's possible to walk in the shoes of these great men and women of the Bible. It is possible for any one of us to step forward in the shoes of David and to pick up five smooth stones from a riverbank and to defeat and slay the monsters that lay ahead of us. Any one of us can sing a new song. Any one of us can walk a new road. It's never too late to change because it's never too late to follow. It's never too late to obey. Lord, may we listen to your voice. May we obey your word. May we follow you wherever you lead. And as you lead your church, even if you lead your church away from tradition, even if you lead your church away from familiar, the way we've always done it, we pray that your church has the courage to follow, the willingness to obey. Your son said, anyone who has ears to listen. May we learn to daily hear and obey. May we daily pick up our cross and follow. Amen. I want these mornings to have meaning for you. So much more so than sitting on your couch. I'm not saying that faith is all about church attendance. It's not. It's not my concern that there's filled pews in the church. It's my concern that worship takes place alone. Worship in the church is about community. It's about those friends and those people that we call family. Your place is here. Or any church that's available to you, please seek out and attend your close local church. It can be a small church. It can be a church without a lot of resources. It can be a church that has two people in the worship band or three people in the choir. It can be a church where the pastor is way too old or way too young. That church is a body of believers. It is the bride of Christ. And each church needs people to serve but we also need one another to hold each other accountable, to make sure that each one of us has the help and support that we need, to know that others are praying for us, but also to receive the encouragement that we need, to leave behind the old life and to embrace the new. And we do that when we share each other's stories, when we lean on one another, I know it's been really easy to fall into this pattern where we watch sermons online. But this is just teaching. And Christians need more than teaching. Fellowship is so much more important and we've got to stop giving fellowship a bad rap. Holding each other accountable embracing, spending more time loving. That is what our churches across the world are needing desperately right now. This Christmas season, I invite you to return to church or to seek out and find a church of your own. Find a place where you can serve. Find a body of believers that you can plug into and help 
and let's welcome in the next year just totally in love with our Savior. I love you guys. I'll see you next week. Bye. Hey, before you go, I wanted to make you aware of some of the Christmas services that will be taking place at Walden Community Church. The first is our Christmas Choir Concert, and this will take place on December 10th and the 11th. It is open to the public, and we would love to have you celebrate Christmas with us. On December 18th in the morning, during both of our worship services, we are the monks are going to be leading worship, and it's going to be a wonderful time of singing carols. On December 24th, Christmas Eve, we will have two services, one at 5 p.m. and one at 7 p.m. And then on Christmas Day, that is a Sunday, but we will have no church services on Christmas Day. Please stay home and enjoy your family. And if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to call the church office or visit our website. Have a blessed Christmas season.